to read the instructions and questions and check your work. All recordings are played only once. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between two old friends who meet each other by accident. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello Frank, how are you? Well John, yeah I'm fine, how are you? I'm great thanks. I haven't seen you since we left school. How long ago is that now? It must be ten years, or is it eleven? No, it's nine years now. So, nine years, A is the correct answer. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello Frank, how are you? Well John, yeah I'm fine, how are you? I'm great thanks. I haven't seen you since we left school. How long ago is that now? It must be ten years, or is it eleven? No, it's nine years now. What are you doing with yourself? You were going to be a doctor, weren't you? Or something medical, like a chiropractor? Well, I was going to be, but that's not what I did. I started medical school, but I didn't really enjoy it. And the idea of doing it for five or six years, and then continuing to study for years after that, didn't really appeal. So I left medical school and went into teacher training college to be a science teacher. And I thought for all these years that you were earning megabucks as a doctor or working in a pharmaceutical company. No, just a teacher. I love it though. I'm so glad I did it instead of medicine. And what are you doing, Frank? After school I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I travelled for a couple of years around the world. Great. Where did you go? Lots of places, but nowhere in Europe. I wanted to travel long distance. First of all, I travelled through India and Nepal. Then I moved into Southeast Asia for a few months. Then I went through Australia and New Zealand. After that, I went to Africa and went around various countries there. After that, it was South America, Central America and North America. How on earth did you afford all that? I just settled down and worked for a few months in places where I could get a job and save money. Then, when I had enough, I moved on. I wasn't exactly staying in luxurious places though. And now what? You always wanted to work with computers, didn't you? Yes, I remember that. However, when I finished all the travelling, I thought of going into travel writing, but it's so competitive. I always fancied journalism as well, so I got into that. And right now, I'm working for the local paper. Did you have to study for that? Well, some people don't. But I went to college for a year to do a journalism course. And I'm glad I did, as it gave me a bit of a head start, and certainly helped me get my first job. And are you married and kids, or what? I married a girl called Liz, that I met whilst I was in Australia. We haven't had kids yet, though we're planning on having at least two or three. What about you? Do you remember Kate, who I dated whilst at school? Of course, the prettiest girl in the school. You didn't marry her, did you? Yes, we managed to stay together all through college. She did teaching too, so we were at the same place for three years at college. We thought about getting married now last year at college, but it was all too much, and then we were too busy the year after graduation. So we did it two years after we graduated. Wow, I'm so happy that you guys stayed together. That's great. Where are you living now? Oh, in Westley. In the High Street, actually. What about you? In Westley, too. We've got a flat near the secondary school. Obviously, then, it's easier to get into work. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Listen, why don't you and Kate come over for dinner sometime? That's a great idea. When? How about next Friday? Can't do Friday, I'm afraid. Both Kate and I have a parent-teacher afternoon on Friday after school, and then we'll have to do the paperwork in the evening. What about Saturday, then? That would normally be fine, but our babysitter is away that night, and we won't be able to find one at such short notice. Why don't you and Liz come over for dinner at ours, and then we'll be able to look after the kids. You'll be able to meet them, too. OK, let's do that, then. Liz will be happy. She won't have to cook. I'll be doing the cooking when you come round. I love cooking. So, what time shall we come round? Eight o'clock? Well, we'll be home around 6.30 that night as we're going out for the afternoon with the kids. I'd say come at about half past seven. Are you sure that's long enough to get things ready? Well, that'll be an hour. I don't need more than that. And what's your phone number, just in case? 01347 835 825. That's the home number. And the mobile is 07978 290 512. What about you? I've only got a mobile. It's 07623 963 957. What was that last bit again? I'll say it all again. 07623 963 957. And I'd better give you the address. Oh yes, that would help. We live at Flat 3, Evergreen Terrace. It's just past the church, on the right. We've got a post box opposite us, and a doctor's surgery next door. I should be able to find that. Anything you don't like to eat? Well, I hate fish and seafood. And Liz doesn't care much for red meat. She likes white meat, though. How about chicken? That should be fine. Oh, yes. When you arrive, none of the bells are marked for security, and there are four buttons. You need to press the bell second from the bottom. Second from the bottom. OK, got that. I'll be able to buzz you in, and then come up to the first floor, and the door will be open. Great. Well, it's so good to see you again, John. I really look forward to seeing you on Saturday and meeting Kate again, and the kids, of course. Yes, and I'm looking forward to meeting Liz. See you Saturday then. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a speaker talking about saving energy in the home. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 12. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 12. Many thanks for inviting me along to talk about saving energy in the home. This is a key issue for many people who now find themselves on tight budgets. So today I'd like to spend a few minutes going through some simple tips to help keep those energy bills to a minimum. I'll start with some easy, cheap ideas before talking about more major solutions later. I think we're all aware of the importance of insulating our homes, and although I'd advise you to get it done, I appreciate it can sometimes be inconvenient to have building work carried out. And though they're growing in popularity, having solar panels installed on the roof 
isn't a cheap enough option for many of us to consider seriously. So what other steps can we take? Well, most people will make a point of turning the heating down when temperatures outside rise, but they ignore other equally useful ways of saving energy when they're making dinner or doing their weekly laundry. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. If you're living in a relatively new apartment or house, you're probably blessed with a cosy, draft-free living space. But for those of us in older properties, the chances are there are gaps all over the place where cold air is getting in. Walk around your home and place the back of your hand around window frames. Can you feel cold air coming in from outside? Get down on your knees at the doors. Is there a draft at floor level? Fix these drafts with some cheap draft excluders and savings in heating bills will begin straight away. And are you using the latest energy saving light bulbs? I'm not recommending you go around your entire property throwing out older ones and replacing them all immediately. But next time a bulb goes, make sure you buy an energy efficient alternative. And what about heating? If you have radiators in every room, do you need them all switched on throughout the day? If they're on timers, set them efficiently. Then there's the laptop or your TV. Do you leave them switched on overnight or on standby? Don't waste money. Turn them off. And that goes for lights as well. You'd be surprised how many people leave them on when they go out. There are also guaranteed savings to be made in the kitchen. I'm always telling my husband not to overfill the kettle when he makes a cup of tea. Why boil more water than you actually need? When you consider how many times that kettle gets used every day, you'll appreciate just how much electricity can be saved by boiling what you need and no more. And the next time you're cooking pasta or potatoes, keep a lid on the pot. The water will boil much more quickly than if you leave it off. And if you've bought yourself a pressure cooker or steamer and it's sitting in the cupboard never being used, get it out. They're much more efficient than pots and pans. Now, the refrigerator and freezer. If the fridge is next to the cooker, it's having to work harder to stay cold. But as I'm giving cheap, easy solutions here, a kitchen redesign might be out of the question. Still, there are other energy saving steps you can take. Keep an eye on the temperature control. We often forget to turn it down in the colder winter months when a high setting is unnecessary. Also, remember to defrost the freezer frequently and try not to overfill it, as this isn't the most efficient way of using it. The washing machine is another potential money saver. A lot of people wash at 40 degrees Celsius, but it's often okay to drop the temperature down to 30 degrees Celsius with similar results. And remember to either wash full loads or select the half load program. Again, a surprising number of people forget to do this. And is it really necessary to dry your clothes in a tumble dryer? If you have a garden or a yard, hang them outside. Or if you're drying them inside, get yourself a cheap clothes rail rather than hanging things over radiators, which robs you of valuable heat. Now, let's turn to some of the help our local council is offering to householders to save energy. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. 
Section 3. In this section, you are going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. Afternoon, everyone. Well, I think we can begin straight away by getting Ivy and Andy to do their presentation. Could you start, Ivy? Yes. Well, um, we've done a survey on local entertainment. Basically, we tried to find out how students feel about the entertainment in the city and how much they use it. Yes, so we've called our project Out and About. Yes, that's a good title, Out and About. We wanted to find out how well students use the entertainment facilities in the city, whether they get to see the latest plays and films, that kind of thing. Now, we have our own facilities on campus, of course. Yes, we deliberately omitted those as we really wanted to examine outside entertainment in the city, as opposed to on the university campus. Actually, there are a lot of areas to choose from, but in the end we limited ourselves to looking at three general categories. Cinema, theatre and music, right? OK, well, first of all, cinema. In the city, there are three main places where you can see films. There's the new multi-screen cinema complex, the old park cinema and the late night Odeon. So if you look at this chart, in terms of audience size, the multi-screen complex accounts for 75% of all cinema seats. The park cinema accounts for 20% of seats and the late-night Odeon has just 5% of seats. As you probably know, the complex and the park show all the latest films, while the late-night cinema tends to show cult films. So when we interviewed the students, we thought the complex would be the most popular choice. But surprisingly, it was the late-night Odeon. Yeah, most students told us that if they wanted to see a new film, they would wait for it to show at the park. The complex is more expensive and further out of the city, so you have to pay more to get there as well. Yes, and that adds to the cost, of course, and attracts the popularity, evidently. Well, next, we looked at theatres. The results here were interesting, because, as you know, there's a theatre on campus, which is popular. But there's also the stage theatre in the city, which is very old and architecturally beautiful. And there's the large modern theatre, the Ashtop which has recently been built. So you just looked at the two theatres in the city? Yes, but the thing about the theatres is that there's a variety of seat prices. Also, the types of performance vary, so students tend to buy seats at both and like using both for different prices, and if they want cheap seats at the ash top, they can just sit further from the front. What we did find that was very interesting is that there are periods during the year where students seem to go to the theatre and periods where they go to the cinema. And we really think that that's something to do with budget. If you look at this graph, you can see that there's a peak around November, December, when they go to the theatre more, and then a period in April, May, when neither is particularly popular. And then theatre viewing seems to fall off virtually, while the cinema becomes quite popular in June, July. Hmm, I think you're probably right about your conclusions. Well, lastly, we looked at music. And this time we were really investigating the sort of small music clubs that offer things like folk or specialise in local bands. So not musicals as much. That's right. We looked at three small music venues and we examined the quality of the entertainment and venue and gave a ranking for these. A cross, meaning that the quality was poor, a tick, meaning it was OK, and two ticks for excellent. First of all, the blues club, which obviously specialises in blues music. This was a pretty small place, and the seating was minimal, so we didn't give that a very good rating. No, we don't recommend that one, really. Then the Sansu, which plays a lot of South American music, was a big place. Very lively, good performers, so two ticks for that one. The Pier Hotel is a folk venue, a good place for local and up-and-coming folk artists to play. Not the best of venues, as it's in a basement, and a bit dark, but the quality if the entertainment was reasonable and the lighting was as warm as we felt. It deserved an average rating. Finally, there's the Bulldrock Cafe, 
which features big rock bands and is pretty popular with students. And we enjoyed ourselves there as well. So total marks for that one. And then did you get any information from the students as to which of the clubs they preferred? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about African penguins. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today's lecture is about a type of adorable animal, the penguin. When you think of penguins, you may picture them surrounded by snow and ice. But not all penguins live where it's cold. African penguins live in the southern tip of Africa. They are usually found within 40 kilometres of the shore and on a number of its surrounding islands. African penguins are also known as jackass penguins because they make donkey-like braying sounds to communicate. African penguins can keep their body temperature at a stable level, but their land habitat can get quite warm, so there are a number of ways for them to stay cool. They limit their daylight movements on breeding sites on land to early mornings and early evenings to avoid too much sun. The pink glands above their eyes can help them cope with the temperate climates. Like other penguins, African penguins spend most of the day feeding in the ocean, which also helps keep them cool. Being a type of small to medium-sized penguin species, African penguins average about 60 centimetres tall and weigh up to 3.6 kilograms. They have a black stripe and a pattern of unique black spots on their chest. Males are larger than females and have larger beaks. Even though they are categorised as birds, African penguins aren't able to fly because of their heavy bones. Their wings are more like flippers that make them particularly suited for life in the water. When they're on land, their flippers and their tails help them keep their balance and walk upright. African penguins begin to breed at the average age of four. When a male and female pair up, they tend to breed together for the rest of their lives. Most other penguins nest and lay their eggs out in the open, but African penguins have a different approach. They dig holes under bushes out of their own excrement, called guano so they are sheltered from the sun and predators. The African penguins survive on a diet that is comprised mainly of marine organisms. They feed primarily on fish like sardines, along with the occasional squid and shellfish. But when normal food is in short supply, they eat tree roots as well. The streamlined body of the African penguin allows it to move through the water like a rocket, capable of reaching a speed of around 20 kilometers per hour when hunting for food. The African penguin's smaller size means that it has many predators, both in the water and also on dry land. Their natural predators at sea include seals and sharks. The biggest threat to them on land is not just towards the adult penguins. The penguin chicks are sometimes taken by seagulls into the air and dropped from above. The seagulls could thus feed on them. At risk from predators, young penguins are protected for about 40 days after hatching by both parents. They will leave the colony when they are between three to five months old and will return a few years later. 
the entire surface of their body is densely covered with feathers, which fall off during the winter. This process is called molting and takes about three weeks to complete. During that time, they are unable to forage. Therefore, prior to this, African penguins spend about five weeks laying down fat deposits. They generally live between 10 to 15 years. However, many do not reach their full lifespan. Their population has drastically declined. Approximately 120,000 African penguins remain in the wild and their population has decreased by 90% in the past 60 years. They are considered to be vulnerable and have been listed as being endangered. Two major factors have contributed to their decline. They are struggling for nesting space due to human disruption and competing for food due to overfishing and pollution. With the limited number of breeding pairs, survivorship becomes difficult for African penguins. This makes them especially vulnerable as environmental conditions change or an outbreak of a disease occurs. For instance, avian malaria has caused 27% of the captive breeding penguins' deaths annually. The more genetic diversity there is within a species, the higher the likelihood that at least some of the individuals will adapt and survive. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.